So we're talking about some instrument repair stuff, um, and Joe and Jeff were just kind of, kind of uh, getting started here a little bit. We're really excited today to bring you the most common band director repair tricks uh, with Joe Betancourt. Um, and welcome, Joe. We're like super excited to have you here. Anybody in Maine, you are a legend. And if people who don't know you have a lot to learn from you, um, Jeff, thank you for dressing up for the event. We You're appreciate welcome. it very much. Um, I want to do a quick plug uh, first before we do that for a couple of businesses. Um, first, I want to tell you about uh, Maine Saxes, which uh, Maine Saxes is a one-on-one -on -one saxophone specialty shop. They only do saxophones, but they do expert repair, sales, and private lessons just north of Portland. Uh, at Maine Saxes, they work with you individually by appointment only, so you can get personalized attention, whether you need saxophone repairs or you're shopping for a horn, a mouthpiece, or reeds, or whatever. Um, they offer a, a wide variety of mouthpieces and saxophones. Um, saxophone mouthpieces they like are Aaron Drake and Morgan mouthpieces and other things. Um, you can visit mainsaxes.com for more information or browse the current inventory of fine saxophones and mouthpieces. And the second business, Joe, this is actually your business. Um, Joe does not need any more repair business, but anybody who's looking for great instruments at a lower price, whether you're looking for one instrument or 10 instruments, Banjo Music, like B-A-N-D-J-O-E Music, um, and his website is banjomusic.com. They carry used instruments in excellent playing condition, including a six-month limited warranty, and they have great prices. And I'll tell you, Joe, we've used a lot of your horns in the past and bought horns, and it's just an amazing service that you give to people. So I assume even if people aren't in Maine, if, that you are able to ship places and you have customers from out of, out of town as well. Um, so we like to promote your business as much as possible. People are going to be hearing more about your business as things go on. Um, so Joe, would you just tell us, uh, you know, 30 seconds about yourself before we get started? Well, um, in the beginning, I, I served a two year apprenticeship to learn uh, woodwind instrument repair and then um, went off to college. And when I came back, I, I was able to uh, secure a repair technician's job at then it was called Eastern Music in West Falmouth. And I worked in that repair shop full time for 12 years. And then there was an opening to go on the road to become an, um, an educational representative and call on teachers in schools to provide rentals, um, accessories and um, repair service um, on a weekly basis. So I went out on the road and for the balance of my career, I, I worked at, um, well, I call it Eastern American Arts. <laughs> uh, it was Eastern Musical, then it became American Music, and then we merged again, finally, with Music and Arts. And somewhere in between, Guitar Centers was involved in that. Because uh, the, the, whole thing, parent the whole thing, you basically have just saved all of us band directors so many countless times. It's just ridiculous. And... You know, if it can't be fixed quickly, you don't do it. But other than that, you're, you're able to fi figure it out. A lot of people who are going to listen to this have been to your clinic um, five minutes before the downbeat, right? And that's geared towards the stuff that fix that breaks right before you perform and how do you fix it quickly uh, and all that. So, you know, Joe and other great repair people are, gr are really good at long-term repairs and being able to fix things really well. But, you know, just as good as, you know, teaching us, you know, normal band directors how to like fix something right now with a really quick fix to get us through the concert, right? Um, we all share that passion, whether we're a repair technician, music educator, um, or whatever, a parent. Uh, we want to see the kid have the, the best success possible in their yeah. musical ex instrument experience. And so. people will be able to on the website and on the, the attachments for the show, you know, Jerry, uh, Joe, you have a list of supplies and a list of tools, as well as a common list of things that have broken, that break all the time. Jeff, you have one as well, and I haven't gotten that in there, but I, I will get that as well. So I thought the best thing to do today would basically kind of go instrument by instrument and just kind of talk shop and, you know, let you guys give us the information and, and you know, I'll jump in as we, we can. Jeff, is that all right with you? It's fine. All right. And I already told before you came on, uh, Jeff, I already asked uh, uh, Kyle to jump in anytime with a clarifying, clarifying question or whatever. So that um, this is a very visual presentation. It's going to be a lot of people who are just hearing the audio portion. 
And so if you can coach me that way, I'd appreciate it. So That'd be great. What instrument do you want to start with, Joe? Let's do it in score order. All right, flute. Let's start with the flute. And um, uh, on all woodwind instruments for diagnostic purposes, you want to start at the top and work your way down to the bottom. Start at the mouthpiece and work your way down. Yeah. yeah. Because if there's a pad or a spring or a cork missing at the top, it's going to affect everything all the way down. So those are the most important things. You have a gumption trap and musical instrument repair is you see something obviously that's broken or damaged because it's been dropped. You fix that one thing. Don't assume you fix the instrument. It could be several other things too. Mm -hmm. So it's important to start at the top and go all the way down, check everything. Um, and starting at the top, one of the one of the things that does fail is the head joint cork yep. in the top of the uh, flute. Head joint cork looks like this. A little bit higher if you can for the. Yep, right there. This, and um, I like to take a razor blade and cut them up into quarters like this for emergency repair use. So you, you pull the uh, head joint cork out of the instrument. Yeah, you're unscrewing the end right now. And then yes. I think, are you going to do the put the drumstick down there and and, and bang it out trick? Is the drum, well, yeah. Yeah. here's the, uh, the flute head joint cork holder, and there's a nut at the top. You unscrew the nut, take the cork off, cut a quarter of it off, put this piece on the back side, put it back in, put it back into the head joint, and you'll get a, actually a pretty permanent fix. That's because great. when you're doing the whole thing, you have to taper this to the head joint, and that takes quite a bit more time. But the quick and dirty way to do it is to just cut off a quarter piece, stick this in, and you'll get a really good tight seal. As you're and showing us that, could you could you either put your screen down a little bit or bring it up, whichever one. We just want to we want to see it. Yep, just so we can see it a little bit better. Great. Just like that. And, and then, so if they've done that, now obviously they have to put it back in. Remind us about how like how far in it's supposed to go and how how we tell all that. And so um, there's a cleaning rod that comes in every flute case. You put the cleaning rod in so that it's got a little notch on it and that has to be in the center window of the embouchure hole. Oh, oh, yeah. So I'm gonna push that in till that notch is right in the middle of the hole. Yep. And that should be A440 right there. Yeah. And then you just screw on the head crown, so it's nice and snug, and you got a good fit. And, and how how will they tell if that's the problem? If the cork is the problem, what's the? Because it's going to be so loose, you can literally pull it out from this end, and uh, even with the taper, it'll still come out, or you can feel it's just kind of loose in there, okay. and that will be problematic. So you won't be able to focus the tone, and the flute just won't respond well at all. Okay. Is there ever a time? Have you, have where, you, is there ever a time when it's tight, but it still needs to be replaced or moved? If it's tight and making a seal, I, I have a saying: don't fix it if it ain't broke. Okay. <laughs> have you ever have you ever used the one where you you don't have time to do as much as that, and you just pop it out, get the cork wet, take a, a match, heat up the cork so it swells a little bit. And you push it back in so you can get the kid out on the field real fast. Because... I, I have not really used, I, I've tried it a couple of times and it just didn't expand enough to make the seal that I felt comfortable with. So um, in that case, 
if I have to really do it quickly, like they're, they're heading out to the field and I'm walking out to the field with them, um, yeah. I would get some of this plumber's uh, tape that you use, you wrap around the threads. Teflon tape, uh, yeah. And the shower head goes on over it to make the seal. You could wrap a couple of these around that head joint cork yep. and that would tighten it up. That would also, this also works good for uh, tenon corks on saxophones and uh, clarinet, yep. polo, bass clarinet, alto clarinet, so on and so forth. Okay, great. Do we want to go, where would we go from there on the flute? All those so, little springs and keys and man, it's so confusing. <laughs> sometimes um, this trill key rod gets hit or bent. And what it happens is it, it binds so that one of them is coming down and sealing, but the other one is not. Yep. And that affects everything on the flute. That's the longest rod on the flute, right? That's the long, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a full foot long yep. and uh, very vulnerable to uh, being hit. So um, I have what we call smooth jaw pliers. So uh, very often it's bent right here. Very often the other bend is up here where it gets hit. And I just take the pliers and pull up on it until it's nice and straight. And that usually will free it up. What what notes does that affect? Is that like affects everything kind of thing? Affects everything because it's the highest tone holes right here. The other thing too you want to look for is quite often um, kids before the concert feel this impulse to clean the instrument thoroughly and they get a polishing ramp rag underneath here because they're trying to remove the tarnish and they pop off the springs yeah. and if the spring comes off then there's no tension on the tone hole and now the flute doesn't work anymore so encourage your children to um, your students not to ever use silver polish on a flute because it has two ingredients that are harmful uh, there's a certain amount of acidity and also an abrasive quality to silver polish um, and it will accelerate rust in the steel rods inside the instrument. So never use silver polish. You can use a silver polish rag and I've got one here. Can be attained at any jewelry shop or even Walmart has them. And you can wipe it down, but don't put the rag underneath the key mechanism and try to polish it underneath because you'll disturb the springs and the spring tension. Okay. So um, as far as adjustment screws, kind of steer away from doing that. But if you're compelled to do it, you should understand what you're doing before you actually do it with the screwdriver. So this adjustment screw at the top between the um, B and the A, you press down the A and that adjustment screw affects this key. So press down here, it affects this. So you back it off, then this key comes up. If you go clockwise, this key will come back down. Yep. And they have to work perfectly in unison together. And we have what we call a feeler gauge that you can make yourself. You get a piece of cassette tape we all remember cassettes, the kids don't, but we do. And a piece of cassette tape and you get a broken clarinet reed and just glue that tape onto the uh, end of the reed and put the tape underneath the pad and check it at um, 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock and nine o'clock. Make sure it's touching the tone hole evenly. And you're, not supposed, tells, you're not supposed to be able to pull it out, right? It's supposed to stay in there. Well, you should be able to feel tension. Okay. You should be able to feel tension. That means it's touching the tone okay. all the way around. Jeff, you want to jump in? Well, the one thing on the two uh, side keys that Joe was talking about up near the top, one, one of the things that I've run into is that, you know, your kids, especially if you're in an outdoor situation and they get a coat on their instrument and they bend the key out. So you have to bend the keys back in, but you can't get them perfectly aligned. So you just take a rubber band around it 
and lash them down so you can get by for that performance. Where exactly that would you put that rubber band? Yeah, yeah, where would you put that? I put it around the, I slip it under the inside, I twist it over, do a double hitch and bring it back around. Yep, as kind of you can do it. Also, um, Jeff, the uh, G-sharp A-flat key sometimes gets caught and gets pulled off. Gets bent into the side there, yeah. Yeah, and, and it springs, look, the spring comes off and you can just take um, an elastic band. Yep, just like that. Just like that and put it like over the- uh, Raise it key. a little bit so we can see it. Yep, yep. Because sometimes we, we, we don't have our toolkit with us, so we have to use our little thing. So I, I always carry um, gaffer's tape, rubber bands, matches, a drumstick, and, a, and a safety pins, paper clips with me in my pocket wherever I go someplace, just as a quick fix for the, those few seconds before you come on the field and everything goes crazy on you. Yeah. Yes, so um, I, even though technically those types of repairs aren't, which we normally do, the bottom line is we want this kid to perform, yep. mm -hmm. able to perform. So whatever it takes. So I have even taken like masking tape and taken a piece mm -hmm. off. And yeah, tape the, the, the pads right, the uh, cups right down. Yep. Yeah. I mean, how often are they going to use a trill key pad, you know, in a performance? Not that often, but if that's if what's it, necessary, I put it right over the tone hole. Yep. On the pad, and that is sealed mm -hmm. that quickly. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Any, anything else flute related we should discuss? Um, yes. Um, it's really important that students keep the inside and the outside of the tenons really clean. Not don't grease them because that kind of attracts dirt and, and dust. But the cleaner you keep it, the smoother and easier it will go together. And that's true of the head joint. So if so, if anybody doesn't know, that's where the the joints go together. Those those spots should be as clean. Yeah. The, the other thing is that when that from the head joint going into the body of the flute, sometimes you know they're talking and they hit the head joint and it puts it out around and you, yeah. can't, they, you can't get it together. So a 2B drumstick goes in there and then you just bend it with your fingers enough to get it together so the kid can play. Yep. It's 2B, it's not, not bigger. That, that drumstick works great for those situations. You bet. A two Keep B, a 2B. Where, where do I get one of these 2Bs? You go to the store and say, I want a set of 2B drumsticks. Okay. It's the, the most common number on a drumstick is a 2B. So, yeah. Great. But every, every music store will have 2Bs. And every drummer's probably got 12 of them in their back, in their pouch, dragging around with them. That's and there's right. always one where it's a spare and you say, the spare is mine now. You can have it back when this is over. Yeah. Well, great. So you guys are both clarinet players, so I'm sure we're going to have a lot to talk about in clarinet land if we're ready to move there. I think we are. Um, oh, clarinet. Um, we yeah, started just, the last podcast with like having that that we were talking about. I had a bass clarinet that was turned at the the middle joint, right? So we just had to turn that so the bridge key was lined up. Is yes. there anything else, Jeff? While we we're mentioning that, that was the E flat wasn't working on that bridge key that that the E flat was E was playing as an E flat. Is there any other sign that that bridge key isn't lined up? Like what other notes don't work or whatever? What else is wonky? Well, if if it, if the bridge key itself, this the on the top portion is bent down, right? Um, it will prevent the F rings from this pad from closing, mm -hmm. which will affect everything from there on down. Now, if it's bent the opposite way too high, then the only thing you lose is the one and one B flat. Okay. Or if the cork falls off between the two bridge keys, you've got to get a piece of tape real fast and make a flake cork so that yeah. they'll keep the proper heights. Mask, masking tape would be a quick fix, quick and dirty yep. for that. So, so you talked about on flute, if there's if there's a big problem, look for that long joint and look for the two the two the, at the top. 
So on clarinet, the bridge key is a good place to check if the whole thing isn't playing. They probably Especially get it. right hand down. That's okay. this, this or, or the A key. If you're if like like Joe said, start from the top down. First, look at the set screw on the A key and make sure the A key screw hasn't backed out. So the A key's up too high, so it just leaks air all the time when you're playing. And the two upper side keys, make sure that they're flush because the kids tend to get them caught on their clothes or their sleeves and they bend them. Yeah. Or oftentimes this adjustment here is messed up uh, simply by if it gets bumped against something, what it does is it spreads this key so it only hits on the back side, not the front side. And, leaves. and a, quick, a quick check on the upper joint and the lower joint is just a seal. I took a flute head joint cork and I put some hot glue inside of it. Makes a perfect stopper for the bottom of the clarinet. Blow into it. If it's and if you hear any air leaking, it's it brings you right to the pad. If it's leaking, right. so you can address it. That's a great trick. Put your finger in the end and cover all three keys, and then yeah. blow, and it should be a tight seal. Same way with the, same way with the bottom joint too. You can you can check that for a seal as well. Take, we notice notice for anybody not looking at it, we he took off the bell, right? And you just you cover it with the end of your hand. And you press yep. down the B E lever. Yep. And uh, that's a, a quick way to check to make sure all the pads are sealed. And is there anything to do? Because I found a lot of times when I do that, if you blow a little bit, it doesn't do anything, but if you blow hard enough, it'll kind of lift and leak a little bit. Yeah, that's that's is that just a weak spring or it, well. Yeah, it's just too much. It's not. There's never. There will never be that much air pressure inside the instrument to create that as a problem. Okay. But with just a normal amount of pressure and it blows open really quick, then you know you got a problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. What, what else do we need to talk about with clarinet? What are other common okay, things? On clarinet, um, on the pads, for instance. Oh, first of all, let me just say, um, it, it's preventative maintenance on clarinets that students should be swabbing out their clarinet after each use because the moisture collection tends to um, um, lower the shelf life of the pad types. With, so with they, the, are we talking silk cloth? Yep, silk or even cotton is fine. Okay. Silk is preferable, but it's a little bit more expensive. Just the, the key thing is not if you, have a swab that the key thing is you use it <laughs> so so swabbing after each use um, i use thermo grip hot glue to install pads um, and if you do put in a new pad it's very important on clarinet pads or the trill key pads on a flute or oboe pads it's a sealed pad and you need to take a pin and stick it in the side of the pad to vent it because when you heat it up, if you're using glue or shellac, the pad will expand. Yep. And it'll make it very difficult to seat and level the pad. But you won't have that problem if you put a little hole in it. Saxophone pads, you don't have to do that because they're already vented with the stud in the middle. So the one thing I would recommend to a band director is that. I, I prefer the hot melt just like you do, but I always just put, put a piece of stick shellac in my pocket with a pack of matches because I, I never use a cigarette lighter because they get too hot. And uh, the other thing that I do is I always bring a huge wad of cotton and masking tape. And then if the pad pops out and I can't find one, I'll wad a piece of cotton in there, put masking tape and try to make a fake pad just so the child can play. Hmm. Whatever works. Yep. Whatever works five minutes before the downbeat. You know, a real quick thing too is a lot of us near the end of the year have some extra budget that we want to spend. You know, I was yep. able to get, I forget the company, but one of those band director repair kits that I'd never invested in just comes yep. with all the, these pads and corks and all that. And it was about $300 or so. I forget the name of the company, but um, probably, pads, probably, what's that? Probably it was a freeze. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And anyway, it was great. It came with a couple tools, didn't come up with everything. But what I was impressed with was all the pads had these self-adhesive backs, which yeah, I'd never yeah. seen before. 
I don't know yep. how well those work, but it seems like pop it they're off, great, put it on. They're great for temporary pads. Are they called Valentino pads? Yep. And, right. And there's Valentino cork as well that you can um, has pre-cut corks. Yep. With an ease of back. That's what I got. So that's temporary stuff that'll get yep. you by in the meantime. Okay. Yeah. 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 Great. So, um, so again. A quick fix uh, for a tone hole covering um, on trill keys, for instance, on a clarinet, I'd stick a piece of uh, masking tape rather than pull all the trill keys off to put a new, new pad on. And that That's kind of time consuming. So, um, and I use, Wellwood contact cement for key corks and for Tenon corks as so the piece of choice for repairs. Tell, tell us how the contact cement works. Okay. It's originally, it was really originally designed for Formica and countertops. And what we, you need to do is put a very thin coat on the key and a very thin coat on the cork. Mm -hmm. and you have to wait till it's dry to the touch. If it's the least bit sticky, it won't work. So as soon as it's dry, then you put the cork on the key and then take a razor blade and cut around the edge of the key and you've got a permanent fix for key cork. So the two sides have to be dry. You put them together and they're, yeah. they're bonded. Yeah, you can't rush it. And it's, it, particularly on cork joints, uh, if you're doing a wrap, wrapping a tenon on a clarinet mm -hmm. or a saxophone mouth pipe, you can't rush it even though it, 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 it does take time for that glue to dry. So. Is, is there anything else that the bass clarinet brings or are anybody else in the clarinet family that's different from the standard B-flat clarinet we're talking about? Well, most bass clarinets hopefully have leather pads as opposed to ladder pads. And um, it's a much better system. Uh, unfortunately, um, in the early years, um, Vito LeBlanc, did build a bunch of um, bass clarinets with the white clarinet pads, the normal clarinet pads, and they don't last as long and they are troublesome. So whenever I saw a troublesome one, there you go, um, I would replace it with leather. I'm trying to get a picture of the leather pads so they can see it. You gotta get it close enough so because you're screen setting. Yeah, they're usually yeah. like a reddish color, right? They're like a sax pad. They look like a sax pad. It's like a sax pad. It's just that they're thinner. Yep. Yeah. And bigger sometimes than smaller. And, um, big. and isn't it a general thing that the bigger the instrument is, the easier it is to break, right? I mean, there's all these long keys and all that. So. Well, the other thing is you've got a, you've got the other bridge key that goes at the bottom from the low E fat flat to the bell. And then if you've got a low C, well, then you've got the extended bell where you've got to make sure that bridge key lines up too. And a lot of times the pet, the cork comes off that the metal part of the, the bell where the bridge key lines up and you're always, you've got to put extra cork in there. And then when you line it up to the E flat key, you've got the crook that goes around the bottom. You've got to adjust it around to find where the right part is to get the key to seat properly. So the low E flat or the low C comes out. Yeah. You got to try to line up the, that bell brace um, yep. with the post as your ideal optimum thing, and then adjust the cork in that setting and, and uh, if i remember correctly yeah it seems like a lot of times when stuff doesn't work on the bass clarinet it's because the kid put the horn together wrong or yeah just not line everything like the bridge key's got to be lined up and that low e flat key has to be lined up for it to work yeah the, the other thing on bass clarinet if, if band directors are buying bass clarinets don't buy the two-piece bass clarinet buy a solid bass clarinet so you're not dealing with that center joint I can't tell you how many times years ago I'd go along, you're playing, and the right hand would go this way with that part of the clarinet, and the left hand would go this way because of the wear and tear on the tendon in the center, and because it's such a large instrument and they're outside playing it, it just snaps right in half. Yeah. Ooh, that's a really, really expensive repair when you break the tendon. It's a throwaway. Yeah. <laughs> go to Toby Castle, trade it in, and see if you can get a used yep. full single piece. Yep. Yep. Well, that's great. Anything else in the clarinet family we need to discuss? Um, there probably is a million things, but um, we could move along to saxophone if you'd like. That would be um, great.
That'd be great. Let's you know, talk saxophone. Just a, a little commercial here built in. Um, keep in mind, when I was doing repairs full time, I averaged over 2,000 repairs in a year going across the bench. And I made an observation. I kind of, as I was doing this, realized that pretty much 70% of the repairs that I was doing was the result of abuse or neglect, one or the other. The other 30% was normal wear and tear. So if you really want to extend your band budget <laughs> for your school instruments and you really want it, the students want to uh, make their instruments last a long time. This preventative maintenance, the idea of using cork grease on the joints, yeah. and I mean, I, I know you talk about it all the time, but you can't reinforce it enough. You got to rub the, the grease into the cork. You got to swab out the instrument. Believe it or not, and I got most people won't believe me. This is my own personal saxophone. I purchased it used, although it was only a year old in 1966. It has all but, I've, I've replaced five pads on this. All the rest is original pads on this instrument. And um, I attribute that, that I'm very careful to use what's called a pad saver, which removes and polishes the inside bore of the instrument every time I use it. And uh, I can, I can, fluff right down, do subtones to B flat without any trouble at all. And again, I've replaced a couple of the uh, palm key pads up here and the low E flat pad, which I call the sewer pad on the saxophone because all the dirt and dust and grime eventually ends up here, like the bottom caps on a trumpet. And I, I, I did want to mention real quick, because I, I only have one area of expertise here, and I do know about the cork grease thing, so I want to jump in. So we, we talk about it in Westbrook about like, it's almost like when you put um, some a lotion on your face, you have to rub it into the pores. That A lot of times, especially the girls, they don't want to get their fingers dirty. You have to yeah, really get it in all the way in all the little holes all the way around. And so at any time they're, they're doing anything with the cork, if it goes squeak, 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 that's a bad thing. So... Yeah. An alert to band directors, if you hear that as your kids' stuff is going together, you know, like about how often should they put the cork grease on? I know you're going to say whenever it's dry, right? But what's right. like a ballpark? I would say every three or four weeks, you got to think about it and rub some in there. Because um, you're on clarinets, for instance, um, and saxophones, if it goes on hard, you're going to be bending keys when you're assembling the top joint and the bottom joint on the clarinet, you're gonna be bending this octave key mechanism because you're gonna hold it like this and you're forcing that mouthpiece on. You're gonna bend this octave key mechanism. And that's the first thing we're gonna talk about on the saxophone. So starting from the top to the bottom, this is always usually a problem in a repair situation. Um, this gets bent so it doesn't close all the way. And, um, so if you're the band director doing the quick and dirty repair, you're going to have to bend that key in order to get it to work. Because when you go from pressing the octave key and you go from G to A, it goes from the lower octave pad to the upper octave pad. And there's got to be a tiny gap. It's perfectly adjusted, a tiny gap between um, this connector, this bridge key and the upper octave key yep so when you go from g to a this opens up and when you go back down this closes and that's the only time that this gets engaged and to bend it you hold this down like this and you press forward just so enough so you got a tiny bit of play and that goes back. So, and so you're, you're squeezing the pad down at the top and yeah. then the loop part around, you're kind of pulling back toward the player if they were playing it. And it's never the other way around. And I, and I, I, I know this happens a lot because oftentimes when the instrument ends up in the repair shop, this is screwed up already tight without the mouth pipe in there. So they're forcing it hard to get it in to begin with. 
and then they're forcing it again with the mouthpiece. Yep. So there's two ways to, to really damage this. And that screw is going to break at some point too, right? If you if you tighten it, you, you don't tighten that screw all the way without something in there, right? Or else it's not going to end up breaking the screw at some point. Well, you just, it should be, you snug it up. Yep. And this, that should be just right like that. I'm not twisting hard on this and, and you always loosen it when you take the mouth pipe out and you can leave it loose yep. until you put the mouth pipe back in again. Okay. Yep. But also one of the other things that I found is that you talk about negligence or abuse of the instrument, which you're hundred, I agree with you hundred percent is that they'll take their neck off and instead of putting it in the slot in the case, they just toss it into the case. Well, in the process of it going through midair and coming down, it has been bent one way or the other. Instead of gently putting it where it belongs, or they're too, they don't want to take the time to take their mouthpiece off. So they just, if they clean the neck and the mouthpiece, if they clean it, then uh, they just jam their cap on and just put it in the side pocket so they can run out. And uh, I, I think that saxophone players are, are chronic abusers of not using a swab on their neck and their mouthpiece. And so what I like to do is I try, I like to find a, a saxophone player who's not done it for a while and I take the reed off and let them look at all the white goo inside there. And then I take a small popsicle stick and scoop it out and said, would anybody like a taste? I said, start cleaning your instrument because that is a bacteria source beyond belief. I had a time when we first started teaching in this town that like we took a, a kid's mouthpiece off and took the ligature off and the reed's still stuck to it, right? And you need like pliers to get it off. And it's just, and you put it in your mouth. That's what Crystal would always say, you know, like you're putting this in your mouth. <laughs> exactly. And that's another thing that, that I know you, it's not today's subject, but someday we'll talk about reeds and the care and maintenance of reeds. Cause that's it's a great Joe, joke. Joe can get, get to the, get to the shop and say, this just won't play. And he'll look at the mouthpiece and it's a disaster. Look at the reed, it's a disaster. Then he'll take it off, put his own mouthpiece on, and he'll be playing like crazy. And he'll say, I don't find anything wrong, but maybe you might look at the reed that doesn't have any tip to it any longer or the mouthpiece that's full of whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Um, other common problems with saxophone is these palm keys get exposed to getting hit, get bent. If they bent up here, it affects everything down below. Yeah. So again, start at the top, make sure these palm keys are covering. I will Often, say in my years, even though I haven't fixed, fixed a lot, more than half of the repairs I do are that top bend when you do the octave key, G to A, that trick is huge. So I appreciate that trick a lot. Yeah. And um, also um, for playing, if kids come to you and say, I, mean, I can't get my B, I can't get my low B flat, Oftentimes it's because of this adjustment screw right here on the G-sharp A-flat key. Um, the, it has to come down. And what happens is when you play B or B-flat, it pulls down the G-sharp A-flat key lever. And if that isn't perfectly adjusted on this bridge key right here, yeah. it'll vent and not allow you to play B and B-flat. So, um, that's a, an, another careful adjustment that has to be made. And also this bridge key has a second adjustment on it that affects the one and one B flat, which- so, so just to be clear, anybody who can't see this, he's talking about the lowest octave, the pinky key, um, yeah. that B and B flat, and then the bridge key that goes in between the right finger and the left pinky. Yeah, yeah. That didn't, that's a confusing- and Also the adjustment- and that adjustment screw also affects the upper register too, because if it's not aligned, you're going to get a leak when you're trying to go above an F and it, or trying to get an F actually is what the bigger problem is. But how about the, uh, the cage on the E flat key down low and the cages around the low B and the B flat, because they don't carefully pick their instrument up and they bang it against the chair, either between their legs or the chair to the person to the right. Great observation, uh, Jeff, and I see a lot of those. Um, the E flat is being held open because the guard itself has been pushed in underneath the pad cup. Yeah. So you just take um, a rod or something and put it behind it and take a hammer and pound it back out again. Mm -hmm. Pliers, you can take pliers and you can grab it and twist it out either way. 
but you got to get that guard off of the pad cup. Joe, am I accurate in saying basically when I get into these um, adjustment screws, if I think it's that as a band director who doesn't know a lot about repair, I, I think I go a little bit in one direction. And if it makes it worse, I might go the other direction a little bit. But if I don't get a quick fix in like 10 seconds, I just put it back where it was and I walk away. Because I feel yeah. like if I do too much, I'm going to just like really mess it up. You know, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, because here's something else that's going to be really important to band directors. Try as best you can never to do a repair in front of your student. Let me repeat that. Oh, yeah. You got to do a repair. Send them off on a mission because it makes you nervous and uptight while you're doing it. Even more so than, you know, five minutes before the downbeat. But if something goes wrong, like you snap off a key or you actually make it worse, the kid isn't standing there who will go home and tell mom and dad, my teacher ruined my instrument. They will call the principal or the superintendent. And now we're having a laugh about this, but I've actually seen that happen. Oh yeah, most definitely. So no good deed goes unpunished. Exactly right. <laughs> So do not try to try your best never to do, try to impress your student by fixing it. Also, if you do it in front of them, the next time they will feel more inclined to do it themselves. And they're just not experienced to do it. So- And then the one other thing that might, as a, from this woodwind standpoint, is they need a small screwdriver and they need to go in to make sure their screws are screwed in all the way, but not socked up tight, just oh. screwed in all the way. How many times do you get to a concert you're playing and a key goes boing, and it's all because the screw popped off the top and you pray to God that it's in your the kid's case and you can just put it back in and you put it back in, but then you they pop the spring. So then you got to go get your crochet hook to try to hook the spring back in place while you're doing it. So uh, they, they need to be responsible for the maintenance of their instruments. And if they don't want to go buy a traditional musician's screwdriver, then go get an eyeglass kit where it has the little tiny screwdriver and it'll fit almost all the screws on the instrument. And uh, especially bass clarinet players where they've got to go down inside here and make sure the screws underneath here are screwed in. Uh, I was playing with one of Kyle's students a while back and all of a sudden my bass clarinet just stopped playing. My fault. I hadn't checked it. One of my screws popped out underneath there. So I had to disassemble the E-flat key, the, the F key, and get in there to fix the screw. But if I had paid attention, I would have seen that. But I had been doing a lot of playing, and I just didn't do it. It was my fault. Yep. And, you know, as a band director, probably a screw, buying a good set of screwdrivers that have um, Phillips head and a variety of sizes of blade screwdrivers, get one that's high quality. And don't loan them out because you always lose them. And don't loan them out. That's right. <laughs> Jeff, do you? I think you need to get going, Jeff. Is that true? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. I, it, great to talk to you, Joe. I, I wish you the best. I hope to see you again soon. Kyle, Thanks. I'll see you later. Good Take care, you, guys. So the Thanks. next thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if, Joe, have you heard about this, but there was another um, a band I worked with at one point. The director was pretty good at instrument repair, and they actually had an instrument repair class where the kids signed up for the class and then anytime something broke, he would teach them how to do all these things. So because he knew enough, they didn't they didn't spend nearly the same amount on repair. And when there wasn't stuff that was broken, I think they used it as another period or whatever. But I don't know if you've ever seen that before or if anybody was able to do that and wanted to. I feel like the band director would have to know their stuff in order to approach that, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, and I would say it's still going to be fairly simple stuff because, um, you know, like – just these adjustment screws that we're talking about on saxophone in particular, oboes for sure. Um, you can really make the instrument a lot worse shape very quickly. Um, so it's almost unplayable if you're not really sure what you're doing and why you're doing it, so. Great, what is the, what is the, the status of YouTube videos with repair? Can you easily go on yeah. and see repair things? Is it good? Yeah, I've, I've gone, and, and watched a few of them. And uh, I, I would say most of the techniques that I've seen are, are very, very good. So for the band director who, who's mechanical and wants to do more of this, 
you know, about how much money do they put in to supplies and things, you know, at, at the most, could you, you could kind of get everything for seven, 800 bucks, something in that range. Oh, I think even less, um, okay. the ingredients to the repair, repair tag of the repair kit that I gave you, um, you could secure a lot of the tools like it, um, um, Lowe's or yeah. Home Depot. And I was gonna, uh, for videos, one that in particular um, person that I've enjoyed watching is this guy named Wes Lee Music Repair. He's got a lot of good videos there and he seems to really know what he's talking. He's down in Alabama. So Wes Lee Music Repair for music videos. Have you reached out to him? Said hi? I haven't, no, good. but I have enjoyed his sense of humor while he was doing it. That's awesome. So, yeah. So, you know, I, uh, most of repair is definitely woodwind related. Yes. Right? Um, you know, do we, should we talk about brass? Like, are there yeah. things that are, you know, we if we have to... time, I, I have a few uh, suggestions. We have time. Okay. Well, his one that's, um, I retired quite a long while ago because it's not worth repairing, but it's on a good for a demo horn. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the most common things that you'll run into, well, stuck slides, right? That's the most common thing. And um, I have a nice setup on my workbench where I can have a, a belt and a vise and I can put tension between here and here and pull them loose with the cranking out of ice. Yep. But most band rooms don't have that type of facility. So um, if it's not really frozen hard in there, but you can't get it to move, taking a um, some penetrating oil and you put it in the joint, yep. try to get that to work in. You can even take- I've even done it with a valve oil and occasionally it helps a little bit. I don't know if that's- Penetrating is better than valve oil because valve oil for the most part is just kerosene, but yep. penetrating is act much thinner and has no lubrication value. Um, it just gets in there and loosens up the stuff. And so you get a few drops on the slide itself. Hopefully it's kind of working its way in. You can even take some heat with a little mini torch yep. and warm that up. It works as a catalyst to draw the oil into the slide. Yep. And then um, I have a half inch open wrench and you put that here and take your... So it kind of grabs onto the slide. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think you can, I can do, hold this and That's do really it. Tough, yeah. but I'm gonna tap on this with a rawhide hammer yep. and try to break it loose. I Once you get move just the slightest little bit the rest of it will come with time i've also yeah. found that as a if i take my rawhide hammer and i go around the two ports where they connect on top and bottom and i just tap a little bit around the the tube sometimes that's enough to loosen it too yes tapping is in addition to heat in addition yeah. to um, the oil tapping on the outside with a rawhide hammer this is um literally made out of leather yep. it's together and it won't I can really whack a trumpet with this and not hurt it yeah. so we also use this for frozen valve cap yep if, if you do frozen, want to be careful I've hit it at points of the trumpet where it does dent it oh I have you got to hit it right the valve cap you, you can't hit it, the right spot. You can't hit it <laughs> anywhere else so, all you're doing is creating a little vibration around the threads yep. so that you can loosen it up same way with the top caps. If you use pliers, this is brass. It's very easy to destroy yep. and make it go out of round. And you, now you've done valve damage. And I'm sure every band director does this, but in case they don't know, um, you should discourage the fathers, especially of these kids on working on the instruments. Yes. Very rarely does it turn out well. And we know what happens if we have grandpa pull the mouthpiece with his pliers and a vise or whatever, it'll pull the whole lead pipe off. So yeah. you have to use a Bobcat mouthpiece puller, which is fairly inexpensive tool, but it's, I've never had a mouthpiece 
stuck frozen on that I couldn't pull with yeah. a bob, bobcat mouthpiece puller. It's perfect. Before I do it, I always try to do it with my hands just to see if I can show them that I'm stronger than them, but it usually doesn't work. No, because it's a, it's a Morse taper fit. It's the same thing that they would use on a collet on a on a South Bend lathe, for instance. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's a friction fit, and it's made to stay put. Even if there's a lot of stress put on it, it'll hold. So never tap the end of the mouthpiece. Don't try to screw it in or pop it. Um, just slide it in, and it'll hold. It won't fall off. The Let only thing I will say is if you're a marching school, because we've done this, turn it carefully, you know, one way or the other to get it in there. Because, you know, I've done it where you snap your horn up and it goes flying. And, and then oh, I had a kid who had four inches of dirt inside the mouthpiece and couldn't play because we couldn't get all the dirt out of the mouthpiece. So, like, yeah, that's the only exception, though. But you're right. Never okay. hammer it. Yeah. I've never seen that before in all these years. That that. There are, there's always exceptions to every I remember the trumpet player's <laughs> name. It was that big of a deal. Yeah. Yep. It's a showstopper. Yep. Um, another common uh, issue with particularly beginners, they will set their instrument down on a flat surface. Yep. Instead of laying it this way. With the second valve stem facing up. They do it this down. way and they do it with quite a bit of power. Yep. And what happens is that energy is transferred to the back side of the second valve casing and will pinch this valve so it won't move. And any of those valve casings, if they are out like a millimeter, the valve just won't work. Oh, so, a, 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 a thousandth of an inch and it will bind. Yep. And, yeah. and like I always look for a dent or something on the valve. If I can't figure out why it's not moving, I always look to see... A, a, a dent on the slide. Yep. Hardly a second valve slide exists in the whole country that isn't got at least one dent on it. But um, so what I do in a quick, rather than valve work takes time and you got special tools and so forth. And it's not a quick five minutes before the downbeat repair. Sometimes I get lucky and you pull off the second valve slide pull out the third valve slide, stick the third valve slide in the second valve slide like this, which gives you leverage and put a little pressure. Whoa, like, you're pushing until, away from the player. Yeah, pushing away like this and you'll see that second valve pop. Wow, yep. I've never heard of that. And then um, you just kind of, you may have to even give it a little tap with your fist like this and then you'll see this will just work perfectly fine. I've, I've on the road. I've done a lot of second valve repairs that way. Wow! Great little trick. Great. And get it done in less than five minutes too. I, I do find that trumpets are pretty indestructible, if you except for a few things. And speaking of one of those, one of the two few things, water key corks. That's yeah. one of the first places you want to check yeah. if the instrument isn't working because it's either fallen out or it's chipped. Yeah. And either way, it's going to leak air. And um, a simple, easy way to check to see if you've got a solder leak in the horn or a leak anywhere in the horn that's important is to press the second valve slide down and your thumb on the second second port, the bottom port like this, blow in. And uh, if it's if it holds a seal, then you know it's tight. I'm going to say that again. You, you press down the second valve. Second, press that down. Cover the bottom port of but with the your valve slide. At the same time. Yep. yep. And it should be tight. Yep. Because that's where and the blow, air is coming up from. Blow in and it should be tight. Yep. Okay. Does that check the whole horn when you do that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great way to check your water key corks to make sure the ceilings, because wow. doing it this way, you get that gr guck and grease. Take it off and put your mouth on it, yeah. So, great. just a thought, just a thought. Those are great, great tips. Um, so, any other brass things? I mean, French horn yes. is kind of known as like the, <laughs> the, the real problem. One. I don't know if we're getting into that or not. 
background here, ready to go, jump there. But um, again, you can really maintain a trumpet or a brass instrument if you've got a, a trumpet bore brush and a mouthpiece brush, and you've got some gasoline for the slides and, uh, and or actually uh, slide grease even yeah. better because yeah. it lasts longer. And um, that should be done regularly. So if this starts to work, this, any of the four slides start to work with, with great effort, grease them. Yeah. Very important to grease them, clean them. You can keep a trumpet pretty clean on the inside if you swab out just the lead pipe and the main tuning slide. Yeah. That'll, because once it gets beyond there, it gets blown into the valve cluster and through the rest of the horn. But if you keep this clean and this lead pipe clean, That'll go a long ways too. Yeah, I, I also will say, uh, I forgot something. What was I going to say? Oh yeah, the third valve slides. For those people, I mean, if you're a beginning teacher and you don't have slides that move on the third valve, they call that the kick slide, right? Oh. Um, in case anybody doesn't know, you have to have it like out a lot for C sharp and about half that for D to wherever it's in tune. But again, I know sometimes we're in a position to not even deal with that because their tone is going to come first and hand position and all that. But basically, there's a different viscosity lubricant that you put on that one. You don't put the tuning slide grease on that. It's I think it's Hetman's number four or something is or five is the one I typically use on that. Hetman but products, it, very good. Yeah, it is a different. There is a first and third valve grease rather than a tuning slide grease, and those should be different. Yeah. Because you don't want your tuning slide coming out as quickly as your first and third valve slide, or else you're going to have some real problems. Right. You might even have a seal issue. Yeah. Too, because their um, third valve slide should be very free. So great. Well, we want to keep going. We have some French horn. Now, every band director that I've run into has always had a curiosity about restringing valves. And the problem is, uh, oftentimes, I'll show them how to do it. But it may be a year or two before they have to do it again and they can't remember how they did it. So try to keep in mind um, a figure eight. That will guide you on, on the direction of um, restringing valves. Um, you need six, 60 pound test, somewhere between 50 and 60 pound test fishing line. Um, it has to be that strong. Yeah. Um, to use and you'll probably to do all three valves or four valves you'll need at least a yard of it to do it okay and um and there are youtube videos right where yes you watch this and i know in the the superior foundations book that shows publishes in in there they do have a you know a, a, a diagram of how to do that as well but that always seems hard to me well you know when you think about it say Sam decided I'm going to restring all three valves, right? But I've never done it before, or I'm, I'm not comfortable doing it um, so, because for whatever reason, um, don't do all three at the same time. In other words, don't take the string off of all three. Do one and use the other two as a guide yep. to restring that one and then go to number two, take that string off and you, you still have one and three to do the guide. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah, so you can just follow that. And you usually start, you have a knot at one end of your string on the bottom of the lever down, down here. Yep. And you go up around, your figure eight goes around the stop arm, back the other side through the hole and then into this string retain retention screw right here. So you, you tighten that up first and then your adjustment screw second. Yep. You know, that's something that even if somebody's looking at the video, that's going to be really hard to, to do or hear about. You really have to get a YouTube video, right? Or get the diagram and really and work. I would with recommend it. that. Yeah. And don't do it quickly. Do it at a time where you don't need that instrument that day because you're not going to get it done if you, if you need that horn that day. Or with the child watching you. <laughs> or with the child watching you. So, Joe, we do. We I do need to wrap it up here in a little bit. Um, are there any other like big picture brass? Or I know we haven't even talked about percussion, but woodwinds I think is by far the bulk of things. Can we maybe come back to um, 
a couple questions that I have for you, if you don't mind, and I don't know if I've prepared you for this or not, and hopefully you're okay with these. Um, beginner instruments, good brands, bad brands in general. Well, yep. Um, stay clear of um, instruments that are catalog grade instruments uh, from primarily from chi China. Yep. Um, you'll notice that their serial number is etched electronically rather than stamped on an instrument. That's a real um, okay. um, flag when you see something etched electronically on, for a serial number or a brand. So let's, um, let's just talk quick. I'm going to give you an instrument. You give me like the best two or three brands. Okay. Flute. So Yamaha is my yep. favorite. We're talking beginner instruments, right? Sure. Yeah. Yamaha, Gemeinhardt, Armstrong, Jupiter, and these okay. are the order of my preference. Uh, so this four makes that a pretty, pretty Clarinet. good. Clarinet. Clarinet. Um, Yamaha, Vito. Um, Bundy. Summer. Yeah. Or the, the Bundy would be the same. They changed. Recently, they changed the trademark. They got rid of Bundy, and they're just calling it Selma, but it's the okay. same thing as the Bundy. Okay. Saxophone. Uh, Jupiter, being the fourth brand, is, okay. is pretty good. Saxophone, Yamaha, number one. Um, number two, um, the Vito. Mm -hmm. It was made by Yamaha. Okay. Not the Vito that's made in China. There's two different... Uh, beginner models and okay. one's a lot more expensive than the other so and the Vita was no longer being manufactured by Yamaha but okay. it's very good if you find one third would be Jupiter and uh, fourth um, well that's good that, that's fine okay. yep um, what and on trumpets Hol trumpets um, yeah. Yamaha Holton I like them both um, the Holton the, tend to be pretty rugged. The Holton's tend. I have a co-teacher, Phil Rich, who we both know well, and you know he loves Holton because they just you can bang him against a chair. They don't. Right? Yeah, most of the ones that you see, um, and at least in our, in the main area, are the American-made ones that were made in Kenosha, and they have a Manel valve cluster. So it's not a plated valve; it's actually solid Manel, which is very hard. And those are hand lapped in. So if you have a, a T602 uh, Holton collegiate trumpet, it has probably a Manel valve system, which is equivalent of any pro valve cluster. Great, great. Yeah, as far as tolerance is concerned, it's very good. Yeah. Uh, the Yamaha is very good. It's not a Manel valve system, but the, they're plate, plated and hand lapped into a very tight tolerance. They're very good. Um, okay. I'm not sure what my third or fourth choice. Do you that's have fine. a third well, choice? Two's fine. That, that's yeah. fine. French okay. horn. French horn. Yamaha, number one. Um, Holton. I yep. like Holton really well. Um, okay. Also for the pro stuff too. Um, okay, trombone. Trombone. I like Yamaha. I like Holton. Um, uh, actually, King made a bunch of really good trombones. Um, they're, Euphonium they're, tuba? Uh, Yamaha, number one. Holton, number two. Um, King made some really good ones as well. Um, so it's kind of all the same for all the brass instruments. You know, Yamaha, yeah. Holton, they're really fair game. I, uh, when it comes to Yamaha, there's, there isn't anything that I think that's made inferior. I mean, it's just like top of the line. Okay, so final question. Um, yep. A message you have for band directors. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Have, 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 I call it the 10, 10, 10. And uh, the 10, 10, 10 is simply, um, and administrators understand this is because they have to deal with business machines, copiers, uh, printers. They know that pretty much 10 years in an office, it's junk. And for school loan instruments, after 10 years, they're in rough shape. Yeah. Now, nobody in Maine is able to, um, unlike the business machines, they just go out the door and they get brand new ones in routinely. But um, 
it would be great if some of the older instruments in the band rooms were upgraded and, and discon something the older ones put to rest, you know, and make at least an ornament on the side of the band room out of them. Um, the second 10 refers to uh, the 10 year lifespan without, and if particularly if they haven't been well maintained, and the 10 year replacement um, value. Um, so 10% of your inventory should be your repair budget. So if you've inventoried your whole band room um, yep. school instruments and you got $100,000 worth of band instruments, you really should have a $10,000 budget, repair budget to service them. It's crazy. Well, we can ask for it at least, right? <laughs> but, in, but don't assume that band directors think you're off the wall. I mean, uh, uh, principals and superintendents would think that's an inappropriate number to ask for because they, they that's why I mentioned the business machines. They're very familiar with the 10, 10, 10 yep. formula. Well, great. Thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. Again, banjomusic.com. You can uh, uh, check that out and connect with Joe via that website as well. There's a Facebook page, uh, Banjo Music. That's uh, we keep the whole inventory for everybody to see right on ban uh, the uh, Facebook page for if you go to Banjo Music on Facebook. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this. It's been amazing hanging out with a legend, Joe Betancourt. <laughs> thank you very much.